Well, open your Bibles uh, or turn them on to Acts chapter 16. Uh, we're studying through the book of Acts, and, uh, and so we'll be in Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 24 today. What we do here every Sunday is pretty simple. Uh, as we study through books of the Bible, one verse at a time, uh, we come here every week and we simply want to read the text, we want to explore the text, we want to apply the text. What does the Word of God say? What does it mean by what it's saying? And what are we supposed to do in light of what it means? And so, uh, and so we aim to be very practical and helpful as we study scripture together. And so we're going to start by reading Acts 16, 16 through 24, so you can follow along with me. It says, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when our owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore their garments off uh, of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And uh, when they had finished inflicting many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailers to keep them safely. And having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and he fasten their feet in stocks. So let's explore this text. Let's walk through it uh, kind of verse by verse. Um, We're actually going to spend most of our time in the front section. I mean, the back end is kind of like repeat of what we keep seeing with Paul and his companions on their missionary journeys. They get beat, they get thrown into prison, like they get run out of the city, whatever. That's kind of like par for the course uh, for the situations and how they unfold. But we're going to start in verse 16. And so it says, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. So this is a continuous scene from last week. And if you remember last week, Pastor Stephen preached uh, on what is known as the Macedonian call. Paul, Paul and his companions, uh, companions, they were um, in uh, in like Asia Minor, and they're doing they're doing uh, work, and they're wanting to continue their mission in a certain direction. And yet Paul gets a vision and they find themselves in Macedonia or in Philippi over Macedonia. That's the short of it. And when they were there last week, we saw that they had, uh, Philippi was very Roman. It's a very Roman city and there was no synagogue. There was basically no Jewish men because 10 Jewish men would mean you'd have to have a synagogue represented some, to some degree, but there was none. So they went on the Sabbath and they found basically a bunch of women praying by water. And at that point, Paul taught them. And then we saw Lady Lydia give her heart to the Lord. And that's basically where we're at. So this is a continuous scene from there. Now they're going out to the place of prayer again. So they're going back out probably to the same place that Lydia was just uh, had just received the Lord. Uh, I'm guessing this is maybe a week later. And Bible study tip, just so you know, uh, pay attention in this text to pronouns. So as you're reading through scripture, uh, remember there are authors here. Luke is the author of the book of Acts. And so we'll start where he says we. So we is, as in uh, Luke is there. You have Paul, you have Timothy, and you have Silas. So we have at least four c- companions uh, here uh, in this trip. And then eventually in verse 19, it's going to switch to where Luke is saying they. So, so Paul and Silas are the ones who ultimately end up getting, uh, getting arrested and persecuted. So that's just kind of an, uh, an FYI, so the we's and the they's to see uh, how Luke here was actually involved. And so on their way to prayer, the time of prayer, they come across this demon-possessed girl, okay? We're going to go here today. So if you're a guest, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about Satan, demons, and the power of Jesus. So welcome. Uh, we just go where the text takes us, okay? So this is going to be good. Now, many are skeptical often about just the whole, you know, spiritual realm or a lot of Christians even. It's like they're fine with the, they're fine with the God and the angel side of things, but like the 
the Satan and demons is more a little bit, seems like maybe optional. We're in a very Western culture. We're uh, very enlightened. And so we try to find, uh, we reason these things away scientifically a lot of times. You know, some scientific explanation. There's a psychological issue there, emotional issue, or drug-related issue. And sometimes that's the case. It's very true. Uh, could be. So not all situations that you see are demonic or, or, you know, or not, vice versa. And so the logic follows, though, that if we believe in a God that created all things and we believe in angels, we love that, right? Guardian angels, got my guardian angels, right? We love angels because angels are real. Then, then the logic follows that the story of Scripture and what the Bible points us to is that then Satan and demons are also real. Okay, we're going to spend uh, our application time there. So I'm just going to kind of pause on that. In this case, this demon girl, or this demon has uh, given this girl this clairvoyant type gift, this ability to fortune tell or predict the future. In the Greek, it was known as the, the python spirit, or she was a soothsayer. Uh, and, and, and basically, it represents the god of Apollo, who was believed to be able to predict to predict the future. And so I want to clarify this. Here's this girl with the ability to predict the future, and yet I don't think she actually had the ability to predict the future anyways, even with the demonic gift. And here's what I mean. God is the only one that is omniscient. That's a fancy theological way of saying he knows everything, past, present, future. God's the only one that, uh, that uh, carries all of the omnis, right? He can, he uh, is omnipowerful, right? He's omniscient. He's all knowing, right? He's all loving. So he's the only one that possesses those. So in this case, I think these are perceived fortune tellings. Because remember, as we'll see later on, that in the spiritual realm, Satan and demons have the ability to influence and affect and impact uh, everyday kinds of reality. So here's what I think when we see a perceived fortune telling. Here's how that can kind of play out. Number one, behavior prediction. So remember, Satan and his demons have been around for a long time. And so in my own home, if I leave a marshmallow on my table and my three-year-old son Joshua walks by, I can rightly predict that marshmallow will probably vanish. And since that marshmallow vanishes, I can probably predict we're going to have some heightened activity in him, right? Uh, because I know him. That's a silly example, but uh, Satan and his demons know our behavior. They understand how human nature works. And so some of it may just be behavior prediction. Some may be into, uh, maybe insight into earthly realities not yet perceived by us. So suppose uh, in the demonic realm uh, or in the spiritual realm, uh, or let's say the earthly realm, my wife is angry with me at home. Well, this is perceived then by maybe Satan and his demons. So let, let's say uh, my sister comes to me or someone comes to me and says, I, I perceive in your future, you're gonna have some tension, some real tension with somebody that you love, right? So then I get home and then my wife like comes at me, which she never does for the record, okay? She's a saint. Um, but it's like, okay, but that was just, that was not like, it was kind of predicting the future from my perspective, but in the earthly reality, they simply just knew a truth before I knew it. Does that make sense? And then finally, another thing is orchestration and actually influence of outcome. So they, they actually like do things to bring it about. So, so it's like, it's like, hey, uh, I'm, you're going to fall down. That's what I predict. And then I push you over. It's like, okay, I predicted the future. Not exactly. So um, it said, so that's just some of how, I don't actually think she was predicting the future, for, but from the earthly perspective, it appeared to be that kind of a gift. Does that make sense? All right. So it said though that military commanders, so this gift was highly valued and that military commanders, they actually wouldn't go out and embark on um, military endeavors without first seeking uh, clairvoyant or the Python spirit and people who had that gift. And actually in Deuteronomy, God tells his own people, don't do this. Like, don't go and, and look for uh, fortune tellers or medians to try to figure that out. And we know that some actually did, and it didn't turn out so well. We won't go there. But they're warned against that because he is their God. He is the one that will uh, give them the information that they need, and they need to put faith and trust him. Okay, so even though she's called a slave girl, this gift is a really valuable gift and was making her owners lots of money. She had a pretty good operation here. So we think slave girls, like some like poor and ratty, like, no, this was probably like a good setup for her as, as well. So she follows Paul around, verse 17, crying out. She's following them around saying, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And she kept doing this for many days. 
And Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And it came out that very hour. So she's following him around for days, shouting and being apparently disruptive. Why does Paul get so annoyed by this? Because look, like if being followed by people that are shouting and disrupting your life is a prerequisite to exercising demons, then I have four candidates at home that are all seven years old and younger. Just saying, can I get amen parents? Let's go. And what she's saying is technically true, right? Servants of the most high God who come to proclaim to you the way of salvation. So why is Paul so upset? greatly annoyed, which I'm like, I have that spiritual gift all the time. It's not really a spiritual gift, but I think there's more here than meets the eye. Something to consider. Remember, we are in a Roman province. These are, these are Gentiles. These are, these are not Jewish people. So when we hear the name most high God, when the Jews hear the name most high God, they think of Yahweh, but that wouldn't have been the case here in a Roman province. If they hear most high God, they're probably uh, thinking in terms of their own religious indoctrination, which was more Greek mythology. So they would have associated most high God with Zeus. And the way of salvation wouldn't have been understood as Jesus Christ or salvation through Yahweh. It would have actually probably been interpreted uh, with regards to the emperor, because the emperor was known as this son of God. He was believed to be the son of God, and he was believed to have brought salvation or bringing salvation to people through the spread of the Roman empire. They bring peace and prosperity. So as she's running around screaming and or shouting and disrupting for many days, these are servants of the most high God proclaiming to the way of salvation. It was probably creating confusion because remember Paul would go into different settings. He would go to synagogues or he would uh, see gods in, in pagan temples and he would use those as platforms then to present the gospel in a way that makes sense to people. So now these people are hearing basically, Hey, these are servants of Zeus here to proclaim to you the way of the emperor. So it appears probably she's creating confusion and is not being helpful. She's being disruptive, which by the way, is that not the tactic of Satan, the enemy to take something that is true? What they're saying is true. And yet knowing that it's going to be misunderstood or misapplied in a way that is completely false. And so Paul rebukes the demon out of her, literally. I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. So Paul says, I command you in the name of Jesus. Now we know the apostle Paul has no spiritual authority in his own right to cast out demons. Nobody does. I command you in the name of Jesus. But what's in the name? Like, is it the five letters J-E-S-U-S? Well, no, because one, it wasn't in English. So it's like that name like doesn't carry power. It's what the name represents that carries power. The name of Jesus carries power because the name represents something, which we've lost that in our culture. Like we say, we make up names for our kids that like just really sound cool. But like names in biblical times had meanings and they really mattered. And you see God often changes people's names uh, when, he, when he transforms their, their hearts. And so you have Paul, the apostle Paul, he has faith and filling. He has faith in Jesus Christ. He has the filling of the Holy Spirit. And so now as he walks in step with the Spirit, living living a life filled with the Spirit of God, he now has the power of the Spirit of God. And so in this moment, in this moment, the Spirit of God prompts him to rebuke this demon in the name and the authority and the power of, of Jesus Christ. And this is important to recognize because like, you know, this claim the name of Jesus thing is often blown way out of proportion. It's like, oh, I claim that in the name of Jesus. It's like, like not for your own will to be done. It's for the will of God to be done. So this demon comes out that very hour, basically meaning essentially immediately. And the owners are furious the owners of this girl, because it says their, their, their means of gain, their, 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 like 
This is where their prosperity was coming from. This demon-possessed girl utilizing her gift and it's gone. So they want revenge and so they want to punish these guys. And so they, they, they rally all the people against them, take them to the magistrates. These are Jewish men. They don't, they don't, they're not Roman. They're not like us. They're, they're doing things that are not in, a, in accord that we shouldn't be doing as Romans. So they get beat and they get thrown into prison. So a major miscalculation, by the way, on the, uh, on the part of the magistrates because they're going to eventually, by the way, God's going to use this whole thing as we get past Easter and we get back into it. This whole thing, they're being in prison and a jailer that comes to know God, like he, he has total control over everything that's happened. It's, a, it's awesome to watch it unfold, uh, the, the story and how God works. But eventually when they get released, the, the magistrates realize, oh, snap, Paul's actually a Roman citizen. We weren't supposed to beat him and throw him in jail without like trial because as a Roman citizen, you have rights. So the magistrates will see, will go to him and be like, hey, look, we're really sorry. Can we just kind of like move on past this thing and try to let him go? It's like, that's a big no-no what you did. Okay, so uh, when I was in high school, uh, I got, is when I got saved. I was about 15 years old and, uh, and, uh, and so everything kind of changed me. But I, I didn't, I had never grown up in, in or really around church at all. So I, like, I was like as brand new as brand new could be. And I didn't understand denominations. I, I didn't understand anything. I was just like, I knew that Jesus had just changed my life and I was, I was turning things around. Well, uh, there was a girl that I was friends with and she was a Christian as well. And there was, I, I mean, maybe I liked her a little bit, but I don't know, like maybe just a little. But I was like, okay, well, what do you do now? Like you're a Christian. I was like, oh, we invite her to church right? You invite a church. Well, at the same time, I had another friend, his name was TJ, and he was, uh, he was just this, like, loved the Lord with all of his heart. His parents, they'd started a church, and he'd always been inviting me to church. He called Brother Josh. He was a black guy. He's like, Brother Josh, love you. Always called me brother. I was like, I want to go to TJ's church. I love this guy. He's so encouraging. And so I was like, hey, why don't you come check out this church with me? And so she was like, all right. So we, we went to, uh, to TJ's church and we got there and uh, it was in a storefront kind of like, kind of like this, but you know, maybe laid out a little bit different. So we get there and we sit and we start to the, start to worship and you know, one thing leads to another and then we're up front then like by the end of the night on our knees with our hands on a girl casting a demon out of her. Yeah, took a turn. It took a turn. Uh, I, you know, I didn't know what I didn't know. And I don't like want to like throw uh, anything or denomination under the bus, but it might have rhymed with Smentecostal church, right? Um, and, and so here's the thing is like, everything can always get blown out of proportion. So, uh, you know, it's just, it is, it is what it is. But uh, in, in a lot of Pentecostal, Pentecostal churches, uh, it can be uh, overboard or out of balance. But in a lot of cases, that I think some of them are in, more in tune to a spiritual reality that other churches neglect. So in this case, and I don't get into all that, but in this case, it's like, here was a girl who actually, actually had a demon. And I never like experienced anything like this. And I don't know how I ended up front, like with a hand on her arm, praying over her. There was like five or six of us. And uh, there were like a lot of little kids in the first service. I, I like kind of helped, but like her voice was changed. She was like vomiting and spitting and she would not say the name of Jesus. And she was slamming her face into the, like it was like stuff happening that like, you don't make this stuff up. Like somebody doesn't pretend to do this kind of stuff. And so eventually by the end of the night, like she was like praising Jesus and she, like it was, it was a surreal experience. So two things that as I look back, I glean from that. Number one, that put me firmly in the friend zone with this girl, okay? So let's just say praise God too, because I love, you know, okay, so, uh, (laughs) but that was the first time that that the, the reality of the spiritual world became kind of real to me. And so, the most dangerous enemy is the one who remains unseen behind enemy lines. And so this is where I want to kind of just spin the application here a, a little bit, just as we, as we work our way to, to close up. I want to talk about Satan, demons, and the power of Jesus, okay? So let's start with just recognizing um, Satan. Now, here, actually, let me give you a little resource, a recommended resource, because I'm just going to barely scratch the surface on some things. But um, 
if you look up David Platt Secret Church, David Platt Secret Church, uh, there's a study, Angels, Demons, and Spiritual Warfare. It's a great, it's like, it's like four hours long. It's an amazing resource that would really help uh, to talk about angels and demons and spiritual warfare. And so it was very helpful as I was like exploring uh, various elements uh, years, years ago. And so uh, David Platt, Secret Church, Angels, Demons, Spiritual Warfare. Okay, let's talk about Satan. So Satan is a fallen angel. He's a fallen angel created by God, uh, fallen from God. Ezekiel 28 is said to be speaking about uh, about Satan. It says this, you were an anointed guardian cherub. I, I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God in the midst of stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. So Satan was a cherub, a high ranking angel who uh, had fallen away from God, rebelled against God and God cast him down. He is vicious, he is powerful. So this, any, any concept of Satan as defined as some like silly, goofy cartoon character should be completely erased from the Christian mind. Uh, is it not a tactic of the enemy to, to, to make you think you're most worst adversary is really just some silly character, okay? Satan is treacherous and he is evil. Satan means adversary, that's what the name means. He is the enemy of God in all things. He's the father of lies, the scripture says. He's a murderer, he is our accuser, and in every aspect, every fiber of his being is now set in opposition to God and the ways of God. Paul says in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14, that he disguises himself as an angel of light. He, he, he likes to make all of his deceptions and his evil schemes look not so evil. He deceived uh, Adam and Eve in the garden. Surely God did it. God doesn't want you to eat of this delicious, this delicious fruit paraphrase, because he knows you'll be like him. Well, Adam and Eve were already like God. They were made in the image of God, and here God doesn't want you to be like him. It's deceptive. Thomas Adams says, Satan, like a fisher, baits his hook according to the appetite of the fish. You see, uh, every person, there's a unique tactic, there's a unique weakness, there's a way in which Satan will seek to deceive you that appears to be very much in line with who you are and your own desires. Satan is real. Demons are real. Demons are fallen angels like Satan, uh, and they're subservient to Satan, so they carry out his will and his work in opposition against God, and they too are terrifying. So when we look through scripture and we see appearances of angels, usually one of the first things that angels from heaven say to the humans is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. In other words, a, a heavenly, holy, angelic being strikes fear in the heart of the humans. Oftentimes they fall down and they're just, just completely overwhelmed in fear Uh, I don't know if any of you are um, Lord of the Rings fans. Um, I mean, I'm a Lord of the Rings fan. I don't need any shout outs though, uh, nor do I need any emails to tell me that I'm un unholy because I think there's magic in there. But um, nonetheless, so that's, what, that's my go-to when I want to veg out and turn my mind off and stop thinking about uh, things. Um, and so um, there's a character in there, Gollum, and he gets the, 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 the ring, right? He's, and, he, and, and it gives him this, obnoxiously long life and the longer he has the ring the more kind of corroded by its its evil and its wickedness and he kind of becomes this like mangled he was a hobbit and he becomes this kind of like mangled fouled smelly creature and I, I think of like 
demons in terms of angels in that like here they are now corrupt fallen angelic beings sitting in their own evil in their vile in their wickedness for thousands and thousands and thousands of years and you think we're we're we are stunned by the presence of a holy beautiful angel from heaven imagine what it would be to be in front of a fallen corrupt sinful wicked demon and we see we see what happens to people when they fall into that kind of wickedness i mean i'm sure you've scrolled through your own um through your own um you know, news feeds, and you see and you hear about people who have done and said, and they just look, and they just become so evil. You think, you think, okay, like, so I'm trying to paint the picture of the, the strength and the terrifying reality of what demons actually are. And so demons then uh, have the ability to impact and influence things in the world. And scripture gives us lots of examples of this. In Luke 13, we see there's a lady who has a, 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 debilita- a demon of like debilitation. It causes her to actually hunch over and, and to walk. It, 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 it disables her. And for 18 years, she was disabled until she was freed. In Mark 9, we'll see there's a demon-possessed boy. It caused him to constantly try to kill himself. He was throwing himself in fire. He was throwing himself in water by influence of the demon. In Matthew, we'll see this in a little bit. I'll go to this text in just a second. Two violent men, they're strong. They're aggressive. Act 16 here, you have this demon gives this girl a gift, an apparent gift that seems to be really good and very causing much uh, prosperity. We know in 1 Timothy, we're warned by Paul Timothy's warned by Paul against doctrines of demons. Demons, they come in with teachings, false teachings, false beliefs. If you guys know about Mormonism, uh, Mormonism, the, uh, the founder, Joseph Smith, was said to have been met by an angel in the woods, the angel of Moroni, who basically brings a message that is contrary to what Scripture teaches about who Jesus is and the Trinity and so on. So Satan is real. He's a fallen angel. His demons are real. They are fallen angels. And all of their works are aimed to dismantle and disrupt and to be in opposition to God. Jesus. Jesus has total power and ultimate control over Satan and his demons. Matthew 8 is a great text. It gives us some insight into this. 8, 28 through 32 says, And when he came, that's Jesus, to the other side, the country of the Gardenes, two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tomb so fierce, so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they, the demons, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? And now a herd of many pigs was feeding some distance from them. And the demons begged him saying, if you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, go. So they came out and they went into the pigs and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the water. Some things I want us to recognize about this interaction. The number one, the demons, they recognize exactly who Jesus is. He is the son of God. What have you to do with us, O Son of God? In James 2, 19, James says, uh, you, believe, you believe that there is one God good. Even the demons believe it and they shudder. If we think that, uh, that demons and Satan are scary to us, it pales in comparison to their fear of the Almighty God. And they respond, they recognize Jesus, and they respond to Jesus to do whatever he wants. They say, they say, if you cast us out, will you cast us out into the pigs? And then he says, go. Like, if you choose to cast us out, they have no choice but to do exactly what Jesus tells them to do. 
And they, they beg, they request to him, if you do this, please do this. We see this in the book of Job when Satan afflicts Job. He goes to God in heaven for permission. And God says, you can afflict my servant up to this point and no more. You do nothing else besides this. And Satan obeys him. God has total control, total sovereignty, total power over Satan and his demons. So they recognize him and they, uh, they respond to whatever he wants and finally they realize that they will be tormented by Jesus one day and there's nothing they can do about it. So we think about all the vile, the wickedness, the evil that we see in the world. Looks sick. Those are all manifestations of the, the kingdom of, of darkness, of a demonic realm. And Satan and his demons and their works and their effects, they will be, they will be wiped out and Satan and his demons will be punished. They will be, it says, tormented for their vileness and their wickedness and their rebellion against God. Now, God could have just killed Satan and his demons, right? Could do it right now in this moment. Boom. Could have done it before Jesus came. Boom. And yet, God chose to go about it another way. Instead of just, he didn't just want to, he just didn't want to destroy Satan and his demons, but he, God actually worked to reclaim back from them that which was originally stolen. Namely, his creation, more specifically, you and me. See, when Satan deceived Eve and the fall happened, God gave the world over for a season to Satan and began to work out a plan to take it back from him. And that, that reclaiming of the world comes ultimately through Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good news. Jesus, the son of God, the second person of the Trinity, he took on flesh, he became man, he entered into enemy territory. He entered into the world that is run currently by Satan. The Bible says that Satan is the God of this world currently. And we know that, that not ultimately, but we know that by permission of God, that has been the case. And as Jesus comes through his teaching, we see teachings, his behaviors, we see the kingdom of light breaking into the kingdom of darkness. You see people that are sick being healed, people that are hungry being fed, people who are thirsty receiving water, people who are believing lies hearing truth. Because both Satan and Jesus, uh, the, and all of their uh, angels and their demons, what they do is they work to bring about the realities of their kingdom. And the realities of their kingdom are reflective of the kings or the gods of that. Now, it's not like an, evil, like an equal battle, a yin and yang, as we've, as we've seen. But we see that they represent their kingdoms. Satan is a liar and Jesus comes as the truth. Satan is a murderer and Jesus is the life. Satan is a tempter and Jesus is a protector. Satan is a thief and Jesus is a provider. Satan is the accuser and Jesus is our advocate. And ultimately, Jesus defeats Satan and humiliates him through what takes place on the cross. You see, the cross, we talk about the gospel and the cross almost every week. It's not just, it's not just that Jesus is a, our substitute. He is our substitute. But he's Christus Victor. He's, he's, we have victory in Christ over Satan, over his demons, over the kingdom of darkness through the death on the cross. Satan thought he was destroying the son of God through Jesus' death on the cross, but really he was destroying himself. He thought he was going to be solidifying his captivity over the things of this world, and he realized, he didn't realize that he was setting the world and its captives free through the death of Jesus on the cross. And ultimately, this is finalized well, solidified in the resurrection as Jesus defeats death and ultimately will be finalized in the final judgment. 
Colossians 1, 13 and 14. I'll call the worship team up as we wrap up. Paul says this, that in Jesus, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You see, this gospel that we preach, this good news, it is a good news that we are sinful. We are like the demons in that. We have rebelled against God. We have turned aside. We have turned away from him. We have chosen the ways of the world and of sin and of flesh. And yet God provides us a way, a pathway towards forgiveness through Jesus, which by the way, is not offered to Satan and his demons. But not only do we get forgiveness of sin, not only can we be made right with God, but we are transferred from being captive and held uh, as, as slaves for the kingdom of darkness, and we are transferred into the kingdom of the beloved son of God, the kingdom of light. So Paul looks at this girl and he says, in the name of Jesus, you come out of her because we are freed through the name of Jesus, which carries the power of the life and the death and the resurrection of our Lord. So some of you, you're in this place, you're here right now, and you are experiencing such lostness or oppression Maybe, maybe real spiritual oppression from the attacks of the enemy. And my encouragement to you right now is to put your faith in Jesus and submit your life to him. There is power in Jesus that can set you free, free from Satan and his demons and his works and their effects. And there's power in Jesus to set you free from the sinfulness of yourself, to make you right with God. This is his gift to you. It's a free gift that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. So the first Sunday of the month, we, as a church family, we take of the Lord's Supper together. And Jesus commands that we do this regularly and and this is a remembrance. It's a remembrance of Jesus. He tells his disciples, they break bread at the Last Supper, and he says, um, as often as you do this, as you're breaking bread, remember my body that's broken for you. And they take the wine, and he tells them, this is the, the cup of, this is the, 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 my blood, the new covenant, the new promise in my blood. And as often as you take it and you drink, to do this in remembrance of, of me. So as God's people, we're to regularly remember the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And, and in doing so, we worship him and we remember and we repent and, and we, we call out to him. And in this moment, in this time, I want us to also remember not just the shed blood and the broken bodies for the forgiveness of our sin, but that this new covenant, this new promise ushers us into a new kingdom. And this kingdom sets us free from the kingdom of darkness. We can have access to that through faith in Jesus and by the power of his spirit as we stand and hold fast to the truth of his word. And so if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you've been, you've been baptized, I want to encourage you as the worship team plays to reflect on, reflect on Jesus and his broken body and his shed blood and confess your sins to God. And if you have, if you have feeling like you, you're being oppressed spiritually, cry out to Jesus that he would break the chains of bondage that are there. And when you're ready, just come down and grab your elements and come back and, and take of that and we'll be, we'll be closing out with a song. And then at the end of the service, there'll be a team of people down here and we want to pray with you. If, you. if you need prayer, if you want us to, uh, to intercede with you and for you on your behalf, come and allow us the opportunity to do that in the name of our Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we worship you in this place. We thank you for the forgiveness that we have in Jesus. We have freedom in Jesus, freedom from our sins, freedom from the 
the bondage and the captivity of the kingdom of darkness. Help us to not fall into that. We need your grace and we need your mercy. We need, the, we need your presence. We need you to guide us. We need to, the, the truth of your word. We need help to not be deceived. And yet you offer us all of those things. We are weak as we stand in the face of the spiritual realities before us. We recognize that we have no power to control any of those things. We, we in and of ourselves don't have power to, to get Satan out or rebuke demons or to not live in sin and bondage to ourselves. We need your power and you offer it to us. And so help us, God, to be your vessels, to be your sons and daughters through faith in Jesus Christ. Free us by the power of your spirit in the mighty name of Jesus. We ask that in this place you would break chains of bondage for your glory. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.